Hey there, Lovecraftians, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, and on today's show, we're gonna go over all the ooey-gooey, tentacly details of cosmic horrors that wanna scoop your brain and eat it for dinner. It's the Monsters of Cthulhu here on today's web. Yeah! We've discussed Call of Cthulhu before on the show. Oh, yeah. Why we like playing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's get gross. Let's get icky. Let's yeah. talk about some monsters. <laughs> some mon the big, big monsters. Big monsters. One of the more uh, just fascinating things about the mythos, uh, whether you're using it as gaming fodder or just enjoying the uh, the stories of it, are the yeah. the monsters and creatures that, uh, that inhabit it, right? Because mm -hmm. some of them are just like other civilizations that are far advanced in, in science and technology and, and perhaps even occult endeavors. And, and they're not necessarily like, evil in the in the D&D sense, right? You know, they're not yeah. like mm, dastardly, mustache twirling evil. They're more just indifferent and utterly uncaring about uh, sort of the fate of, of, of humanity. Um, uh, yes, yes. We, we are beneath <laughs> them as, you know, is it evil to step on an ant pile as you walk by yeah. uh, in your trek to do whatever? I don't know. It may, might be to the ants. Uh, to the ants, yeah. <laughs> but to you, you didn't. Yeah, there's no consequence. Uh, so <laughs> like, that's sort of the, the framework that we're coming from here. You know, the, this is the Cthulhu mythos, right? In which yeah. uh, our understanding of a mechanistic, kind of naturalistic world with, with the laws of nature and reality that work and they're sort of provable and, and, and they're known and, and the rest of the universe is just ours for the taking and we can uh, understand it if through the principles of science and blah, 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 blah. And the mythos shatters that and says, no, the laws of, of reality differ out there. Yeah. And, and the observable phenomenon that we can see, its origins and its, its catalysts and the like, are not what we think they are. And also, it's not necessarily universal uh, out there. Uh, you know, even, even the history of our own world is, is different and, and not what we think it is. And there have been multiple civilizations that have rose over billions of years, depending on which ones you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And our place in that thing is, is more than likely suggested to be a joke, the uh, result of one of these other races that have uh, inhabited the planet and, and maybe just, uh, you know, as a... Like I said, one of the one of the books suggests maybe like a joke, or yeah. an accident, or, or or you know an experiment or, or some kind. So yeah. these are the kind of monsters that that we're talking about, the sort of villains and antagonists, and you know that frame of reference is applicable to other settings and other you know particularly like dark fantasy or weird fantasy, fantasy horror, mm -hmm. all of that can be. Uh, blend it up together rather nicely. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, these kinds of monsters are my favorite in D&D. It's why I love using aberrations. Right, right, It's the right. same, same thing. Sort I of mean, thing. Things that are going to come out of, out of the depths of space and either eat your mind or destroy your mind or mm -hmm. a combination of both. You combination know. of both, sure. What are some of your favorites then from like the mythos, right? From the mythos, um, just just looking it over, I my eye is drawn immediately to the, the, the dole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The D hole, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a giant ass worm that like burrows underneath. It's a monstrosity. Like, right, right. It is it's like, like fully, gigantic. fully Absolutely. grown. And these things are they're huge. But I can't stop thinking about one of my favorite movies from the '80s, Tremors. And like, <laughs> what if that was actually just a Cthulhu story, of uh -huh, uh -huh. of some like coming out of just being birthed, some some doles that sure. were just birthed and like left in this valley to just. There's enough humans there. Eat them, grow larger. We'll come back for you later. Come back for you later. Uh, yeah. You have a couple of those people that freak out when they see them, right. and they you know they fail their sanity <laughs> checks. One guy like gets up in the in the electric line, whatever, and he stays up there till he starves to death. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't know. It's it's, it's right there. I mean, like, I, yeah, I see what you're saying about tremors. Yeah. It's like it has that same kind of some some of the people just you know they break. They, they, yeah. They, they can't um, handle it. Others rise to the occasion. But but the fact that these things, I mean, they can swallow whole like very large areas, but. Their goo attack, they can spit goo like two to three miles. I mean, they're gigantic creatures, right? Yeah. Like, they're just like, absolutely enormous. They're yeah. enormous. And the fact that they can, like, hit you from that far away, like some freaking artillery or something, you know. <laughs> can we get a goo attack? We just right. bring it down on top of us. <laughs> um, also, is Dune, like, is that is that a, is Arrakis just a... I mean, first off, there is that, that <laughs> the, the the worms from Dune yeah. is is what I think of, right, whenever you yeah. think of these giant uh, sort of worms. And these things put, like, purple worms to shame, right? Yeah, they, they shit them. purple worms. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're much larger, much uh, much more just uh, a presence. Mm -hmm. And speaking of sort of, like, worms and, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Chthonians. 
Yeah. Um, if only because they have that sort of wormy kind of uh, the massiveness of, of the dole, though they're not as, as big, an intelligent worm. Right. Right. Like, at least for the Chthonians, they're highly capable psychics and, and sort of like very powerful telepaths that can control people. But they're this sort of gross worm looking thing that at, at one end is just like a telescoping mass of tentacles. And so mm -hmm. it's like, one sheath of tentacles comes out and then those split off into others. And so you can imagine this thing like burrowing underneath the city somewhere and then like probing up through it with just the tentacles. Yeah. In an adventure scenario, maybe, maybe you know, the people are like in a house or a ruin or something and tentacles are bursting up through the ground. Yeah. And it, it's this thing is, you know, dozens of feet below them just like slithering its probes up through. Yeah, maybe that's more tremors. I see, it's like getting that yeah. and then like it causes it all to like collapse because there's all these things coming up. But there's something even far more sinister of it is what if it's just there underneath the city slowly manipulating the politics of the city, making people go mad. Uh, some of these creatures, the Chthonians, they have spells associated with them or even considered like basically alien gods. And so you could get something that powerful. Now you have a, an entity that's like, how do you get rid of that thing? What do, you, what do you do with it? How do you combat that? How do you combat the influence of it? You think of like mastermind creatures, it maybe is like a, a spell caster or something like that. Not a, a worm the size of, a, of, of an aircraft or something, right. you know, like a jetliner you know, also can uh, control your mind. That's mm -hmm. not exactly a traditional uh, enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You don't want those brain worms. I also like the, uh, I don't like them, they just creep me out. Flying polyps, <laughs> just saying that out loud. The polyps. The polyps, mm -hmm. they're just absolutely gross. But the fact that A, they can fly, Right. B, they can go invisible. Uh huh. So uh -huh. you have flying and invisible. Sure. Yeah. Right. And then they have all these like wind attacks that mm -hmm. they can buffet you with. They can attack you from like a thousand feet or yards away with this thing to try to like slow you down uh -huh. to like get to like you. Come up on you. Like, yeah. Like, flying. like, and they're not like, I mean, they're big, but they're not like that big. But just, right. just, I don't know what it is about it. Like, <laughs> I mean, I hate, I hate things that fly and sting. Yeah. But things that can fly. Sting and they're invisible. They're invisible. Oh, gee, right. oh, come on. Yeah, are you it kidding? Just, it look, the look of it is just bizarre, right? It's oh, this God. sort of wormy, writhy mass of like buboes or, or some sort of pustules and, and, yep. and like wispy little polyps. Tentacle polyps, <laughs> yeah. right? Like wispy little tentacles and like that sort of fly off uh -huh. of it. But the whole shape of it is like a, a grub worm that's yeah. about the size of a VW bug or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, but just the idea of those things being up there watching us, like right, right now. Well, and they can travel through the star. Like so yeah. many of these creatures yes. just like I just don't want to be on this planet anymore and they Deuces. just take yeah. off They're right. <laughs> uh, some of them you uh, do that through technology but many of these monsters do it through just their natural uh, or, or the, you know their their body mm -hmm. uh, some of them are, are pan dimensional they, they occupy uh, you know two dimensions at once and use mm -hmm. the whatever's going on in this one dimension to you know affect things in this one it's one of those things you look at that monster and it's just like this is just a gross oozy tentacly monster and you read more about it and it's like oh no they're actually a whole race of space faring mm -hmm. things and they have this great war with another yeah you know weird uh sentient psychic fungus thing <laughs> you know like it's just the aliens of the cthulhu mythos are truly alien yeah. they're not uh, people with prosthetics on, yeah. they are just like... Not, not two arms, two legs, with a head, you know, bipedal <laughs> like everyone else. Yes. Just, you know, uh, what, what is that, sympathetic evolution or something like that? Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I can't, yeah, I can't remember the name. Out. Oh, we're all kind of the same, but just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. like, oh, no, 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 this is just a bulbous sack of flesh with ooze with tentacles coming out <laughs> and no, no symmetrical... Yeah, yeah. nothing like that. Nothing. One of the races I love. Yeah. Just because they're fucking, ugh. everything about it is just disgusting is the deep ones. Yes. And everything oh, yeah. that comes from that. Because right. you could do a whole campaign just over this one race, right? Like right. how they pro how they reproduce and everything about that. Mm -hmm, like this, mm -hmm. this amphibious race they come from the deep. They're yeah. like servants of Cthulhu. They sort of worship them. Uh, mm -hmm. they've, they've got the ones that are, that are very old, sort of Dagon and, and yeah. Hydra, the, the ones that are really just big and, and massive. And you... You get the sense from them that you know that there's cities of these things yeah. underneath. Like that there's just a whole other parallel civilization on Earth that takes place underneath the waves. You know, if we're talking about something like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or a more traditional fantasy world, there's often Tritons and Merfolk and oh, yeah. Sogwin and and Kutoa and all these sorts of fishy hybrid yeah. creatures. Sogwin is what it what they remind me of. The fact that the deep ones appear to be able to mate and produce hybrids, right? So there's that. 
there's all of the horrific implications of what that exactly means. Of course, if you've read the stories, you uh, have an idea of what that means. But. Yeah, it means that cults are bringing women down to the beaches, um, and then later these these they're they're giving birth to hybrids, mm -hmm. which they then try to coax into the deep to complete right, that process, complete process. That, and become more mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. deep ones. Um, but oh. There's a place in Forgotten Realms, some isles. I forget what the exact name of them are, but they have they have a similar vibe to this, where it's just like some people remote out in the out in the sea, far mm -hmm. away from the, yeah. the Zord Coast, and, and uh, the, the the horrific sea monsters that live in uh, you know live in that ocean <laughs> have sort of got these islands in their thrall, and sort of a similar situation where they're creating these hybrids. And so, like the deep ones, they play off that fear of the the ocean being an utterly alien place, right? Mm -hmm. That things can be down there, and, uh, and you would never know about it, and the depths that they can survive at, the environment that they need to live in means that they're probably much stronger and faster and and, and oh, yeah. durable than you are. You know, the Cthulhu mythos takes something that's kind of familiar and makes it terrifying by you know heightening the unknown and, and inserting these monsters that are that are utterly alien into it and whereas I think more traditional fantasy goes the opposite direction and says oh the underworld's fine you know it's, it's just underwater right like you get a simple spell you can go under there no problems and you know the mythos really takes the fact that the sea is a mysterious and at times very terrifying place with real monsters in it right like real predators and and, and mm -hmm. animals that are very dangerous and and, and much, uh, you know, sort of stronger, faster, tougher than humanity, and, and then like puts like, you know, make believe monsters in it. I spoke earlier about the, the, the flying polyps. I think the, the Yithians, right? The uh, great race of Yith, called so because they've mastered uh, time travel and can send their minds up and down time seemingly at, at will and without any trouble. And so this is a, a race that at one point saw their demise and like cast their minds into another species, which was these conical looking fungoid creatures that happen to be living on Earth, I guess. Mm -hmm. And and so whatever they are, the Yithians originally looked like, they now look like these like 10 foot tall chitinous cones with these like fungal appendages on them. They have a, a thing. They think they got this thing where they maybe drink from, <laughs> with the <laughs> trumpet horns it's on like it. like a trumpet horn thing. Yeah, and then there's like cl pincer claws and then, a, <laughs> and then a head with eyes and more tentacles. <laughs> Uh, I actually have a miniature of them, it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're called a great race because they're able to to travel through time, and they also have a lot of technology and the like that they use to, to sort of supplement this, including temporal communicators that allow them to talk to, say, the, the humans that, that form part of their cults, r regardless of time and space, so where they are, they'll be able to talk, or, or a yeah. stasis cube that they use to propel themselves into the future. Like, step in this box, it'll be a matter of seconds for you, and millions of years will pass on the outside. Yeah. Someone will be along to open it. We, we'll cast our mind up there. Yeah, open we'll, it up. We'll meet you there. We'll meet yeah, you yeah. there, but we want, want, that's how they physically kind of, uh, at least forward. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, oh, it's such a cool concept. It's such a cool concept, and the concept of, of, of exchanging your brains, uh, your mind across the vast distances of time and space means that, you know, what happened to the minds of the creatures that were in these fungal bodies? Well, they got sent back where the Yithians came from and suffered the catastrophe that the Yithians are, are leaving, and presumably that's what they'll do again and, and, and again and again, because what they do when they, they sort of settle is they cast their minds out to learn all they can about the time that it is. So you might take your brain, and now your brain's in a Yithian body, wherever the hell they are now, talking to other people whose brains have been stolen from them. And then the person who is you is now an alien mind that's learning as much as it can before it will report back what it learned. And so they have a very sinister undertone. A lot of these uh, civilizations, races, they're, they're portrayed as like scientists and explorers and the like. And, mm -hmm. and, and you think for a minute, like, oh, what a noble, wonderful like you know, that, that's like the uh, shades of Star Trek you know like yeah. they just explore the galaxy and, and like but I you know maybe it's because uh, you know Lovecraft came from a time where exploration and colonization carried different uh, uh, connotations for, for what you might do to the people that you found there and yeah, you can yeah. see that in some of these civilizations, the Yithians especially, but, but uh, others as well. Yeah, they, they pretty much take and strip your identity away <laughs> and uh, <laughs> take what they want, what they all want, the natural yeah. resources of, of whatever it's you have. It's not a pleasant experience. Uh -huh. And they're some of the most mild and kind of the mythos monsters. Yeah. They'll at least erase your memory of, of the horrific things that you experienced, uh, and it'll just come out in your dreams. <laughs> at least they're considerate to that point, right? Well, the next one I w I'd like to talk about, we're going to bump up uh, in power level here, but to one of the gods. Ah, okay. But uh, featured recently 
uh, in our uh, Call of Cthulhu game over in Counter Roleplay was Yog Sothoth. Ooh. He's all about that planar travel uh-huh, and, and uh-huh. getting his cults to transition between the planes. Uh, the way we they used him there is we found out he's actually God. Mm. And our main villain was actually the devil, <laughs> and that Earth was actually hell, and uh, God was trying to return down to destroy hell and the devil once and for all. Nice. And so he's trying to facilitate this cult to like bring about God's return into. So it was just it was a, a insanely cool complex web of, of cultists and mm-hmm, rival mm-hmm, cultists. Mm-hmm. And when you can get multiple cults going a, right. at each other, that's. The, the heart of what Cthulhu is all about, right, is just insanity and chaos and driving men to the point of the brink of madness, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. making yeah. it ju- making the waters just right, and then you know they're ready yeah, like to dip their tentacles sure. in. Sure. Um, but yeah, like I, I I don't know I love I it's love like how it, kind of the the sort of the, the theme of it. You obviously don't want to touch this thing, which is just of course right. massive. massive. I mean right. it's it's not Abhoth. Right, right, right. But it's this massive hunk of like. <laughs> Just globs and tentacles and like these. Formless and ever changing. Oh, it's Mm. just disgusting. Just the descriptions of that. Like, I still think about it. Uh It's one of those uh things. It's like you get that in your brain and it's hard to get out. Hard to get out. Hard Um, to get out. One of the things about the mythos that that I'm always fascinated by, number one, is the way the stories were written when they they came out. There's there's not a system to it. It seems very uh, ad hoc. It has the feel of a of being wild and uncertain and it's like what are all these outer gods doing and and we know that some of the the the, you know the great one or the great old ones or 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 even the the lesser uh alien races there they some of them worship the outer gods uh to what benefit to what gain would Mm -hmm. you do that and and i think like using a creature like uh yogsothoth or or some of the other ones that it really (laughs) highlights how utterly alien these creatures are because a lot of times you just worship them in order to gain some the benefit of planar travel or some yeah. insight into the the real nature of the cosmos and right it's gonna it's gonna damage you in the process but that obsession of needing to know or needing that power drives you to interact with these deities well yeah because it's always just like the promise at first yeah at first you're like you're like i i know there are other planes i want to get to them and you find this this piece of information yeah this yeah. hidden secret yeah. that promises the exact thing that you want and yeah. it's always like way after you're already past the point of no return uh-huh, uh-huh. that you realize like oh no no that, that was just that was the lure that was the bait for the angler fish to, yes. to eat your face off <laughs> um, and but that's that's the way it is with most of most yeah. of these uh, these these beasties yeah particularly the ones that we would call like alien gods or outer gods or things mm-hmm. like that now many of them their their scientific and technological understanding make them like unto gods right the Yithians are able to traverse through time and, and, and influence events outside of the normal time and that's pretty shoot you, you know, with their lightning guns they got lightning guns all these <laughs> To, presumably to kill the polyps that eventually uh, yeah. you know, defeated them. But there's others, right? The elder things, who are even a- more ancient than, than the Yithians. And another sort of like psychic, sentient fungus thing. They're, they're sort of a radial symmetry, a barrel body with wings and arms around it and little legs and then a flowering tentacle head. Yeah. It just like, you know, it looks nothing like uh, like what you would, like, it's not like a sci-fi thing, right? Where there's a bit of, the, the way people and aliens are sort of shaped or you know, relatable and you can imagine. Slightly familiar. The slightly familiar, they're humanoidish, yeah. right? And and the fact that, that this race, the elder things that were you know, around billions of years ago and, and, and created the Shuggoths, who are who are these sort of like oozing multicellular mass of creatures that can form whatever body parts they need at the moment, uh, and they may or may not have accidentally or as a joke created all life on Earth, the Elder Things, before their civilization collapses. But they're capable of building things like parallel and pocket dimensions that allow them to traverse billions of light years at a time. That's the the level of uh, technological uh, superiority that they're working with is to do these things. In that sense, mm-hmm. uh, a lot about the mythos is is very much like science fantasy and, and the blurring yeah. of lines between magic and, and uh, technology. Um, the Migo, the fungoid from uh, uh, from Yugoth are mm-hmm. a really fun one. It's a one of many creatures in the mythos that are capable of flight, in inter- interstellar flight, because they are catching 
trans-dimensional winds on their wings and it propels them further. And, and maybe they use like chemicals and other things to make them more uh, you know, durable to the vacuum or something like that. But the Migo just have this, I don't know, they look like flies, like giant flies with sort of like vaguely people faces, but yeah. they're also utterly alien and don't look anything like that. Yeah. They kind of remind me of the alien from, not Species, but Mimic. Remember that movie Mimic? Oh yeah, I read the book. <laughs> the chitons all together, like, sort of looks like a human, but then it kind of comes apart and you can tell how really like insectile and, and, and uh, disturbing that it is. There's the aliens that will put your brain in a cylinder and like attach things to it so that you can talk and hear and see, but your brain in a cylinder allows you to like accompany them on their interstellar voyages. <laughs> yeah, it's right. like the worst <laughs> type of Doctor Who to, I'll be your companion. Right. All right, hang on. And there you go. Uh, but <laughs> but, but you know, what? <laughs> it highlights yeah. the superiority of say their medical technology, their yeah. understanding of human anatomy. The, the Migo are here, uh, at least on Earth, to extract metals and other precious resources and may or may not be the source of like alien myths and abductions and things like that. Uh -huh. So like, what is that? look like for your for your like more traditional fantasy world well they're you know trans-dimensional or, or cosmic travelers that are sort of here and they're not here to take over they're not here to like conquer the place but they are here to like get some stuff out of it and they will build cities and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that but it, it's mm -hmm. they're not here for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, back to that whole, um, the era of colonization and yeah, right. the I mean, effects sort of thereof. The yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you can sort of see the, the, that similar sort of pattern repeated there. And then finally, of like the ancient kind of like uh, races that I think are my favorite because they tie in uh, to a lot of like real world <laughs> conspiracy theories and the like that I'm really a, a, a fan of it, uh, just sort of reading is the serpent people. Mm -hmm. and these are sort of humanoid serpent people, like gigantic serpents with arms and legs and sort yeah. of torsos and the like. And they, around during the the Permian to Pleistocene era, so, so uh, but degenerate, a big theme in, in Lovecraft, all these advanced races become degenerate. They lose their ability to create technology and mm -hmm. the powers that they have, and they become just mindless beasts or go into hibernation or something. I sort of see the same way with like serpent people, where some of them now just sort of live underground and are, and are degenerate and don't have the powers of sorcery and science that they used to have, and others of them walk among us. They're true self disguised by uh, magic and science science uh, to keep us in the dark from their sinister ways. Mm -hmm. um, Every now and again you see a forked tongue flick out. <laughs> so they're masters of alchemy, poison, science, and magic. They have uh, a lot of really cool uh, devices and, and, and substances. Uh, black lotus powder, is, you, you would give it to someone, right? And it, and it causes that person to experience horrific visions and hallucinations of the mythos and, and the real nature of reality and, and sort of like seeing things for as, as they are. It also makes you highly susceptible to questioning. I like this sort of substance because it's a great villain thing that you can use in almost anything. It's like, yeah, you're the one who's going to have to pay the price, the insanity for understanding this knowledge. And then I'm just going to talk to you about it. I don't want to experience it firsthand, but there's something that you have that you're seeing that I need. Your mind's going to break for it. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to do this again to the next person tomorrow. Yeah. But for now, we're, we're gathering this information and it's helpful. Maybe that's how the you know, this particular wicked sorcerer or something learns their magic uh, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah we, we basically did that with the Necronomicon. Yeah. So, Somebody yeah. looked at it. We were just Somebody asking them it. questions uh -huh. while they were looking at it. It's like, because they had the most sanity. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's the thing about this game. Um, <laughs> right. Ugh. Uh, and so those are sort of the four like ancient, uh, the, all of these predate human civilization and the mythos and, and, and you know a lot of the fantasy worlds that uh, we play in also have long histories with multiple civilizations running through different cycles and, and in those stories they tend to be like oh this was the time of, this was like the eighth elven civilization or dwarf or something like that and you can kind of inject some horror and some weirdness and some uncertainty if they're not the nice neat consumer friendly uh, kind of human uh, Humanoids that are in traditional fantasy are instead, uh, you know, alien beings or, or creatures from other dimensions or planes. You know, consider all the different civilizations that are in your 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 fantasy world, and, and is there a way to kind of make them more sinister or more alien? And will that like do something to your setting, make it more uh, in depth or, or part of a larger world? That's why these are my favorite ones. There's some like monsters that I like, but mm -hmm. I've always been a fan of the ones that are like this is just an alien civilization that well, they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, because that's, that's easy to transplant, like, a whole civilization or a whole race of people. I mean, you, you just bring that right alongside your, your other traditional fantasy races. And right. it, 
you know, and then be right next to the Elithids sure. if, you're, if you're doing D and D, things like that. But yeah, I mean, this is like this is what we love doing is is mixing finding, and matching, yeah, yeah, finding those inspirations outside of what you're normally doing, and it just mm, just a little bit of flavor. It's very good. Sometimes it's a whole just, different thing. Yeah, sometimes just going to another system and looking at their monsters, looking at their magic and things like that will be uh, inspiration enough to to get through it. We talked about the Shoggoth. They're these sort of like I said oozing. This is one of those things where it's like you see a picture or a drawing or something, and, and what you really want is to see the thing. Move. In motion, yeah, right. There's all these, even the ones that have like diagrams for how these creatures move and, yeah. and the like. You're still like, can we just get some animation over here? A quick stop motion, right? Uh, not to be com confused with the uh, you know the formless uh, shapes and the like, you know, formless horrors and spawn. Shoggoth is a, a creature that sometimes used by elder things or deep ones or, or other mythos creatures to do like I guess manual labor. Mm -hmm. It's sort of assumed that they're created as a servitor species of some kind that eventually overthrew their creators. But they're also just like big 15 foot balls of oozy nothing that form whatever appendages they need at the moment and like are incredibly strong and tough, can't be harmed by normal sorts of weapons and, and like roll over and suck in their victims and then like just pull them apart and absorb them. And it's just, to me, they are the quintessential Cthulhu monster. Yeah. It's just a big mass of nothing but tentacles and mouths and, and, and pus and slime and it's going to grab you and, and, and just completely absorb you into it. You're utterly, you know, there's not even a corpse left over. And all the while your mind is just destroyed by the knowledge that this thing exists and the implications of what that means yeah. for the rest of humanity. Yeah, it's um, like the blob. Yeah, yeah. And then you look at that and it's like D&D &D turns that into the gibbering mouth. There's something about the, the translation from um, uh, you know the story, the fiction of everything into game mechanics that that loses some of this. And if depending on the game that you're playing, you know Call of Cthulhu reinforces the horror of these things by them being incredibly tough and strong, and and you do not want to fight these things. Uh, and if you do, many of them are immune to conventional weaponry. Yeah, uh, you, you, you gotta have some kind of magic or bless something or yeah. uh, whatever. I mean, it's nice to have that. Sure, uh, sure But for sure. the most part, even with that, you might not be able to withstand the the mental barrage no, to no. fight to finish it off. You might not, but that's not the only way to use these monsters. And talking just the mythos in general, one of the great things about it is that multiple authors have contributed to it, and both in Lovecraft's uh, own time and since then. And and one of the things that I liked was seeing how uh, the Conan stories handle the mythos kind of creatures that show up. And in those, it's there's some you know <laughs> people in the story who run and hide and their minds are blasted, but the heroes of the story, the sort of the protagonist Conan in this case, is is not daunted by it, but mm -hmm. repulsed and, and uses the sort of like, what is this thing? Not, not in a way to like shrink into the corner and, and be terrified of the implications that this thing exists, but is more like, no, n no, like you have to be out, you have to leave, we have to destroy you and, and fight you and, and, and overcome you. And of course, you know, it being Conan, well, that's what happens. But it, it, it's a template for using uh, these sorts of creatures in a more traditional fantasy style game because it doesn't necessarily need to be that one of these shows up and uh, you know just like blasts the sanity of everything around you. It's fun when it does, but they can also be used in, in a bit less horrific ways and more just to play up their weirdness and their otherworldliness. There are a couple of settings that relate specifically to Dungeons and Dragons uh, uh, that that feature mythos monsters, and one of those is Midgard. Uh, if you have the Creature Codex or the Tome of Beasts, you know that things like Migo uh, and, and other uh, types of deep ones, I believe, show up in there as well. Although um, Volos has the Deep Spawn, which are yeah. uh, sort of similar to that. Yeah. Um, it, and so that setting, Midgard, has uh, sort of Cthulhu influence, right? It's not uh, the only thing going on. There's a lot of other uh, influences in the Midgard setting, and uh, but it, the fact that it has this dark undertone of, of the mythos creatures mm -hmm. that are there, sort of on the fringes of it, is is one of the things that I like about um, I like about that setting. The other one is Carcosa, which is an OSR setting uh, that is basically uh, a yeah. world in which Cthulhu and all the other great old ones and outer gods and, and all the other mythos creatures they've been here, they've ruled this place. They never stopped ruling this place, 
and there is humanity. But humanity has been created or, or stolen from its home planet or, or brought here somehow to this planet and then uh, genetically engineered by the serpent folk and space aliens and, and the elder things and everyone else, mostly the serpent folk, to be uh, exactly the kind of humans they need to perform their blasphemous rituals and, and spells. Uh, one of those things where humanity is very much at the bottom of the rung on Carcosa. They live a Stone Age existence of, of village states with a couple of hundred people. They live in a world that, where they, they're confronted daily with the fact that beings far older and far more powerful than them are present and active and, and dominant. So why create, why invent, why inquire, or just endure? And so there's a kind yeah. of fatalism to the humanity there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's a depressing and dark setting, but if you're looking for like what the mythos looks like in a fantasy world and how it could be played out, the Carcosa setting is one to uh, potentially check out. Yeah. <laughs> Like the word hope doesn't even it doesn't even exist. Yeah, it, why, why would you? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> and it, I guess you know there are different ways to play it, right? The the baseline Carcosa, you're looking at it, and all you can think of is just uh, how in the world would you fight any of these creatures? Like you've got a, a, a flint spear and some and maybe bone armor or something. Mm -hmm. Like what are you supposed to do against a Shoggoth or or any other number of, of creatures alike? Let alone the the outer gods and all that and. Uh, and Carcosa answers that question by going, well, there's laser guns and cyborgs and like big robots that run around. <laughs> and yeah. it's just, uh, it, it's a mishmash of uh, the Cthulhu mythos with some sci-fi elements that is, is really fun and a good example of how to use these creatures in a fantasy setting that also really plays up the horror and, and uh, just absolute depravity that is uh, encountered in the mythos. Oh, dear. Yeah, fun times. Mm, no. No. <laughs> well, if you have enough sanity after that Cthulhu monster episode, head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, Starward Bound, Unearthly Twilights, and Land Between Two Rivers, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Can we do it one more time? I'd like to do it one more time. And then this time, I'm... I'm gonna apologize, Stuart, yeah. and I hope they don't call the cops. What's up? I'm, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna right. fucking gonna scream. scream. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, Jim, because I'm gonna be pointed at you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta let it go. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm talking like fucking tongue getting ripped out in gonna, in the I'm horror gonna go, house scream. I'm gonna go right for your mouth. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. And we have that recorded also. <laughs> for... You could you could come out a shade earlier, Stuart. Yeah, if you could come a little earlier, right at my mouth, that'll be great. Okay. okay. Wow. <laughs> what? He's coming out over here. Children are watching. <laughs> There's your stinger.